Okay, so you 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 say you say guitar? No, no, not the instrument, the country. Get <laughs> you knucklehead. No, cot. Well, we used to say cotter. Then it was cater or cotter, and now everybody's saying. So we'll go with Qatar. All right. All right. Yeah. Big game today. Come on down. Okay. Uh, see you later. Hey, yeah, big, 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 big day. What a beautiful spring day in downtown St. Catharines. Here in Niagara, we are here on uh, season three of episode 44 of uh, Niagara 411 Live with Lee Sterry. We are fueled by Gales Gas Bars, supported by Verge Insurance Group. We are powered by WeStream, and we are ensconced in this lovely whorehouse. Poorhouse, 194 uh, St. Paul Streets West, and, and I'll tell you, uh, this is a great place to come on down. If you want to see the game today, it uh, it airs at, uh, I do believe it goes to air, kick is at uh, 2 p.m., and uh, Fiddler's Poorhouse is ready for you. And please, come on down, and come on down for lunch beforehand. Uh, watch some of the show, join us, come on in, say hi, uh, say something or other about what you want to see today, and uh, stick around for the game. It should be great. Now, you know that we had an asteroid that turned into a fireball that became a meteor that then became a meteorite, and uh, pieces and parts of it are somewhere lying around Niagara, they think. So we're going to bring science writer and meteorologist from the Weather Network, Scott Sutherland, in to talk about that big fireball in the sky above uh, Niagara that happened a few nights ago. So uh, Scott's going to be here, and we may, we may, fingers crossed, all technology working as it's supposed to be, we may very well have a Niagara person who is in Qatar right now, who is going to the game today between Belgium and Canada on the show, uh, so we're keeping our fingers crossed and uh, we'll see how that works out. So give us about 30 seconds and we'll get this Shane Dig underway. Come on in. Hey, Lou, and there it is, your logo on the right-hand side of the screen. This is probably the biggest day for soccer fans, and maybe, well, maybe not just for soccer fans, Canadians in general. First time in 36 years that Canada has been playing a game in the World Cup of Soccer. And they're taking on some pretty heady competition today, and as I mentioned up front, it happens at about 2 o'clock. And uh, of course, Fiddler's Poorhouse here downtown St. Catharines on St. Paul Street is all ready uh, and, uh, and, uh, to, to rock and bring that show to you. It's on the, the soccer's on the TVs around us here. And uh, Spain is doing uh, pretty well against Costa Rica at the moment. Uh, last time I looked, it was 3-0. Uh, it could have moved on past then because we've been getting ready to do the show. Anyway, uh, come on down here and um, if you see fit, there's some great food, some great camaraderie, all kinds of TVs, etc. for you to watch the Canada-Belgium game, which uh, kicks off at two today. Uh, World Cup, uh, big, big deal, 36 years it has been since Canada has been in the World Cup. And uh, Kevin, put yourself on the screen there, would you, my friend? Because there, there he is, resplendent in, yes, we know this is hockey regalia, but nevertheless, the intent is there, the, the, you know, the emotion is good, and uh, that is Kevin Jack, ladies and gentlemen, co-founder of WeStream, Canada's premier streaming company, uh, and uh, executive producer of this program. Kevin. We were talking about this before the show, and it was there are varying opinions on how Canada is going to fare in this World Cup, not just Game 1, but World Cup in general. Now, of course, Belgium is uh, not a weak opponent. Chances are they'll give Canada quite a game. But leading up to this whole thing, like over the past year or more even, 
Canada has been uh, sort of like the poster child for the most improved soccer team on the planet because they were beating everybody in sight because of how they were they're coached the new way they approach the game uh the sim uh, the symbiotic relationship that's a big word eh symbiotic relationship of their players and uh, this is a different canada than showed up at the world cup 36 years ago yeah don't, don't you think oh i couldn't agree more i mean 36 years ago we were happy to be here now, yeah, just uh, be able to show up. Now we'd almost be disappointed if we didn't at least win a game, you know. And, and for Canada, I have that's higher huge. expectations than that. And I'm not a soccer guy, but I, because of the way Canada has ha, ha, has has done itself well over the last little while, I just think we I just think we could be kind of a dark horse here. Yeah, I, I don't think you're wrong. I was um, listening to some you know people everywhere talking about soccer and analyzing soccer, and somebody pointed out that hey. You know what? Mexico's fared very well in their first game. Canada yeah. beat Mexico. Yeah. USA fared very well in their first game. Canada beat the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, Belgium is ranked number two in the world. So, I mean, formidable opponent, and I mean, what a way to go into a World Cup. But for me, Lee, and I think for a lot of Canadians, okay, 36 years ago, I was nine. That's fine. <laughs> for the first time... That's, that's really irritating for me when you say that, you know. That. For the first time in my life, <laughs> I have a country to cheer for at the World Cup. Yeah, because we want, we we don't we always have to pick a, a country by proxy. Like, where are we from? Uh, Canadian uh, Italians would have to choose uh, Italy, right? right. Um, How, all the Dutch around Niagara. Exactly. It's a sea of orange usually around World Cup time. Exactly, and of course you get the Spains and the Brazils and the you know and all those uh, and the and Germany and so you'd you'd flash the colors of your heritage. Now you have a choice. You have a choice to flash the colors of your heritage, or you have a choice to flash the colors of your citizenship. That's kind of cool. Yeah, I, I really hope that all Canadians root now for Canada 1, and then, you know, whatever their ancestry is, that becomes their yeah. second favorite team. Like, you know, if, yeah. you use, if you're an Italian-Canadian and you're flying the green, white, and red for years and years and years, now you're, fl you're flying the yeah. red and white. And you're always going to have the Brits. I mean, they're going to, you know, they're going to have their teams, you know. Uh, but, you know, it's always been that way, you know. And we were talking earlier, has there ever been a Scottish team in the World Cup? I think they've made it once or twice. And, I mean, that's where my family traces back to is Scotland. Yeah. So, I mean, and really wouldn't you think they're so, they're so football proud, you know, and they don't have a, they've never had a team here. I don't get it, but I guess I guess England takes all the good players, right? Yeah, but I mean, go Canada, go! I'm so pumped. I'm so excited to see them on this stage, to see them perform, to be in the World yeah. Cup, and then it's given cool. the fact, and looking down the road in four years, the World Cup is coming to Mexico, America, and yeah. Canada, yeah. and I think they're also expanding the tournament. So what's great is. In four years' time, Canada would get in by default as being one of the host nations. Yeah. So if we didn't qualify now, four years from now, they'd be saying, ah, Canada, they're only in because, because they're hosting. Yeah, they got in by, by, by default. Right. And now you Absolutely. could say, no, no, we deserve to be here. We were there four years ago, and we're here again now. Yeah, that's, it's very, very cool. And whether you're, a, whether you're a soccer fan or not a soccer fan or very knowledgeable about it or not, like myself... Um, it's, it, this is going to be really, really fun to watch. And Canada really goes in with zero expectations. Now, they have expectations, I am sure. Their team and their coaches uh, and, uh, and, and Soccer Canada, whatever the organization is, uh, I'm sure they have expectations. But as far as the soccer elites are concerned, there are no expectations. There's no pressure on Canada. They go in, everybody will expect them to be the underdog going into just about every game. Yep, you're absolutely right. So, And, uh, and then, Lee, I'm doing the total Canadian thing. You know, I don't have much uh, soccer paraphernalia, so, of course, I wear my hockey jersey and my hockey hat to support the men's national soccer Now, you program. mentioned your son uh, goes to soccer from time to time, and he's a little bit wound up about this. Yeah, he's getting into the World Cup of Soccer. That's great. You know, it's on in the morning because of the time change and what have you. So he was asking and his age this morning. Is what, six? He's seven now. Seven? And he right. plays soccer. He's played in Niagara Falls. He's currently playing in Welland in the Welland Wizards program. He's got a practice tonight. It's, it's great. But he asked me this morning, hey, where's the soccer on TV? 
So he wants to watch that's FIFA. And of course, one thing that's great about the World Cup is it's easy to comprehend because it's nation against nation. Yeah. Right. Outside of that, am I watching English Premiership, the Bundesliga? Oh, I'm watching whoosh. Liga One. It's it's a little confusing where yeah. the players from. Um, but when it comes to FIFA, it's it's very black and white. It's, exactly. These are the best I, I players would, in Canada. I was in England about a month and a half ago, and we were talking to people that know things about soccer, et cetera. And this uh, this fellow was talking about how confusing is it, it is. There are so many different leagues, and there's so many different divisions, and uh, probably the biggest teams in uh, in the UK are owned by people that live in the Middle East. Nobody really in England owns one of the big teams anymore. They're all owned by conglomerates and it's uh, it's really quite the mess if you look at the business of soccer. But you're right, when it comes to the World Cup, it's the FIFA thing, it's a country, it's a flag versus a flag. End of story. Yeah, and I'm expecting to see this place just absolutely fill up between now and the two o'clock kickoff. There's yeah. no better place in Niagara to watch the game than right here at Fiddler's Poorhouse. They got screens everywhere. You can probably hear in the background they're playing the audio, so you are absolutely going to be immersed in the experience. And I will be here in my red and white. I encourage you to do the same. <laughs> uh, okay. I, 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 please tell me, please tell me that uh, light and dark blue and tan are not Belgium colors. <laughs> I, I, I just I just got dressed this morning. I, They're, uh, I, 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 black, yellow, and red, so you're safe. Okay. You're safe. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Lee, I want to try and connect with this guy, Rick, Rick Beaver. Beaver. Yeah. He's in Qatar right now, and he's in the fan yeah. zone, and we're going to see if we can connect with him out there. But, hey, you know, Internet being what it is in Qatar, not exactly sure how this is going to so go. So what do you want me to do while you're doing that? Well, I want, to I want you to talk about this other sports milestone uh, with a bit of a local flair. Ah, oh, geez, just a second. I kind of dropped it okay. here. Okay. But a um, uh, local guy, Mac. Hallowell, okay, is and just a second here. I want to make sure. Okay, you're throwing you're throwing me a high soft curveball here because I have no idea who the, what you're talking about. So Mac Hallowell is he um, does this to me, ladies and gentlemen. He just just because he's the executive producer, he lets this executive thing go to his head. What, Kevin? Well, here's Mac Hallowell. He's a professional hockey player. All right. And he's from Niagara Falls. Okay. And he's been playing with the Toronto Marlies. Oh, okay. We did have a look at this earlier. With the I apologize. Yeah, with the injuries to the Maple Leafs blue line. My bad. Mac Hallowell's been called up from the Marlies. And tonight will be making not just his Leafs debut, but his NHL debut. Okay. And there are so many people around Niagara that know Mac. Um, you can see here's a post. Even our mayor, our mayor, Jim, De uh, uh, not our mayor, uh, the mayor of Niagara Falls, Jim Diodati, our boy. Mac Hollowell from Niagara Falls will be making his NHL debut tonight for the Toronto Maple Leafs against the New Jersey Devils. Congrats, Mac. Your hometown is behind you, and we can't wait to cheer you on. So there you go. That's, uh, it's nice to see a, a local boy. Back in, the, back in the early days of the Niagara Falls Flyers when I was uh, a young lad, which it means that it was like Stone Age days back then, um, of course, we had the Niagara Falls Flyers. They were the farm team for the Boston uh, Bruins, and we had uh, the uh, we had the Bobby Orr's and all those uh, folks uh, playing Derek Sanderson and all those guys that were uh, going through here. I actually went to school with Derek Sanderson. That's how that's how long ago I went to school. But uh, it's nice to see these local guys um, come through and still. Still skating well and, uh, and, and doing more for Niagara. So Mac Hollowell from Niagara making his NHL debut tonight with the Leafs against the Devils. The uh, Kevin, Devils. any progress? Uh, let's see if we, I think I've connected with Rick, but I don't know if he's able to turn his video on, but uh, that's totally fine. Let's just see if we got him. Hey, Rick, can, uh, can you hear us? Uh, the connection just dropped here. So okay, I'm going to try him again. No, but while you're doing that, though, um, uh, I want to tell you about what we have coming up on the rest of the program after I once again acknowledge our sponsors. Gales Gaspars Limited continue to fuel this program as they have done almost since its inception. We appreciate the fact that you're here. And, and in these days, I mentioned this last week a little bit too, in these days when oil companies are taking, uh, suffering the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, as we say, from all around the planet with the price of oil and the price of gas, etc., uh, local businesses still step up and do their work. And, uh, and Gales has done more than their fair share for Niagara. They are a living wage employer here, which means that anybody that works for that company has, uh, is not making any less 
uh, on 99.99% .99 of the time more than what is designated as a living wage for living here in the region of Niagara. So uh, just, and, and they were one of the first companies, if not the first company in Niagara to do that. They're also a rainbow registered company, the first company in the petroleum industry in Ontario to be registered as such, which means that regardless of your race, color, creed, or however many letters you will identify yourself by, whether you are, a, are an employee or a customer, uh, Gales, Gaspar's properties are safe havens for you. All right. Verge Insurance Group, we thank Mark Shirk, uh, Son Blake, and the rest of the gang for continuing to underwrite this program. Get that insurance, guys? See what I did there? Underwrite? See what I did there? Verge Insurance Group uh, and Sh Brokers Limited, <laughs> thank you for supporting the program. We really do appreciate it. And uh, for all the effort that uh, Kevin and Brandon Scram's company, WeStream, goes to to put this thing on every week, and it's no small feat, uh, believe it or not, but uh, we make it look easy, or they make it look easy, and I guess that's the secret of something that is a quality product. If something looks easy, then uh, you know it's difficult, and uh, WeStream always makes their good work look easy. So, Kevin, it's always a pleasure to work. And you as well, Lee. And I'm just going to see here if we've got Rick at all. Rick, can Let's you hear try. us? Can you hear us here from Canada? I, know I hear something in the background. Rick, it's Lee Sterry calling, uh, talking uh, from um, Ontario Street, or St. Paul Street in uh, St. Catharines, Ontario. And I know you're in Qatar trying to maybe get your tickets checked out. Can you hear us? We got nothing there yet, Kev. Yeah, no, I know. I don't know. I, I've tried them twice. This is the third time. You know, and it's this is dropped uh, off. It's it's Qatar. There's thousands of people there. It's it's difficult to make a cell connection. So. It's 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 Qatar. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, you say Qatar, I say Qatar. Right, here whatever. you go. He messaged me and says he's underground and not getting a good connection. All right. Well, when he gets above ground, he'll probably get back to you. Yeah. So there we go. All right. Um, uh, coming up at 1240 today, Scott Sutherland, he has been on the program from time to time. He is sort of our go-to guy when we want to talk about uh, anything to do with uh, astronomy, um, space uh, um, flights, rockets, uh, also weather because he's a meteorologist with the Weather Network, but he's a science writer predominantly with that organization. And this past week was a really interesting week here in Niagara and a lot of people caught videos or photos of what was an asteroid turned meteor turned meteorite including a sonic boom in there and it happened i believe kevin we established it was 326 saturday morning in other words very very late friday night early saturday morning and the, there has even been an appeal go out from uh, the government etc for anybody that finds a piece of this thing because they'd like to know where it landed and right now we're still unsure of where it landed but scott sutherland is the guy who's going to fill us in on what what's going on here so lee on that i'm just going to interrupt you because i know we'll get to these videos later on yeah. but um co-owner of WeStream, brandon scram went to scott sutherland's article to find out exactly when the meteor flew across right. niagara said it was 3 26 a.m on Saturday morning. So we went to his, uh, his cameras, right. and I'm going to suggest that you look in the top left. Okay. So this is 326 a.m. Okay, see uh, that flare? It's actually a street light right there that you see. Uh, that's, Brand that's the front of Brandon's house on Lakeshore Boulevard, St. Catharines in the north end. Oh, see that? See that? What lo it looked like heat lightning uh, on the top left-hand corner. And Kevin, I know, will play it again. So there's this flash there, right there. That's 3.26 a.m. this past Saturday morning uh, over the lake in, uh, over the Lake Ontario in, in St. Catharines off Lakeshore Road. Yeah, so if you've got security cameras at home, 3.26 a.m. this past Saturday, if you can dial it back because that's all that, that's all that Brandon did. He got the details from Scott said, okay, let's see what my camera picked yeah. up at 326. And for him, as you can see, the timestamp in the bottom, it's almost, oh, you can't see the seconds there. It's almost, no, but it's almost dead on 326. Well, it's almost 327. Yeah. It's 326. Well, by the time it got there. 45, 50 seconds. Yeah. 
And there yeah. you go. I mean, that's that's cool stuff. <laughs> it really is. All right, so we're going to be talking about uh, about that with uh, with Scott Southern, Kevin. I want to break away f- here and do something completely and now for something completely different, uh, as the uh, as the Pythons used to say. Um, do you receive much? I call it junk mail, but it's not really junk mail, I suppose. Many pieces of mail that are financial appeals for donations, whether it's the Princess Margaret Hospital in Toronto, whether it's uh, hospice, whether it's any, any, any of the big charities, the uh, Canadian Cancer Society, any of those. Do you get that stuff at your house? A little bit, but it's your standard fare, coupons and flyers and stuff like that. Okay, but the, here's, I have a, my wife and I have a, Pet peeve, and and I do this Elizabeth a little bit hesitantly because I do not want to diss this organization because they are a terrific organization. I'm just using it as an example because all kinds of organizations do the same thing. So, let me reach over here. So, this package arrived in in my mailbox the other day. Now, first of all, this package it's it's it, it's thick. It's full of stuff. It's fairly big. It's 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 larger than your average envelope. So in order to send this out, Canada Post is going to charge more than a fifty cent stamp. All right. So when you reach into this, here's the here's the stuff that comes out. Now, this we received. I got to tell you, in in the interest of uh, of clarity, and again, I'm not trying to diss the organization because they do great work, but it's just an example of what I think is a wasteful way to collect money. This comes from the uh, the Canadian Red Cross, and it says on the front, uh, "Please, uh, Canadian Red Cross, please reply by December the 19th. See enclosed for a matching gift opportunity that could triple the impact of your support." Now. Um, Probably the reason that we get this is the fact that we have contributed. Uh, we have we'll get throw that over there. We have donated uh, to the Red Cross in the past numerous times. My wife donates to charity. We do our bit, right? Uh, so they keep coming back for more, which is is natural. If you donate once, maybe they you'll donate again, and which we have done. So you get a pen. Uh, they've even gone to the they've even gone to the point of putting my wife's name on the pen. Linda, St- now, it's a cheap pen, granted. It's, uh, it's not a Mont, Co- Mont, Blanc, or Mont Blanc or whatever it is. Uh, anyway, uh, my wife's name is on the pen. All right, so there you wow. go. Wow, it went all out, Lee. They're See, this to, is really trying to court you. Unless everybody that has ever contributed, his name is Linda Sterry, chances are <laughs> it's a separate pen. All right, now, in addition to this, are these. That's nice. These are little... Timely. Yeah, these are little stretchy red Canadian mitt. Kevin, I, they probably wouldn't fit you, but they would uh, match your... They would, yeah. It'd be perfect for today. Your, your outfit. Your little girl could probably wear these. Actually, take them home with you. I will, thank you. Yeah, okay. So that Do I have can, to donate? Uh, well, apparently not. Okay. Because they came in the mail. Maybe I got one at home. Maybe so, I got that package. So there you go. Oh, that's nice. We have a little bear. Now, the bear is meet Rudy. Rudy, uh, the Red Cross comfort bear. You can help children feel safe when they need it most. Now, the sentiment is very nice. I get that. And again, I'm not making fun. I'm just saying... Come imagine the, the amount of money that goes into sending this stuff out for a charity when they're trying to get you to send them money. This is what you're getting. So we've got, now we've got Rudy the Bear. Okay. Um, now here, we've got uh, your gift of $35 or more. Could, I wonder if it costs them 35 bucks to send, send us this. All right. Uh, so anyway, there's... There's the explanation of who Rudy the Bear is. Then here is uh, Betre de... Oh, French side, sorry. Uh, building strong communities. Walmart. Okay, so obviously Walmart paid for the printing of this and uh, got stuffed in in there. What's this is this? all in the same package? I'm confused now. It's all in the same envelope. 
And this, this is where everything just gets stuck into a little background and like that. Um, all this is in the same, same envelope. Canadian oh Red Cross God. depends on uh, support I'm exhausted already, Lee. I know. Uh, to fulfill your mission to transform lives. That's why your participation in the triple gift offer for 2022. Is anybody going to read all of this? I just don't. I just don't understand how, the, and, and I love the Red Cross, you do fabulous work, but you're getting really crappy marketing advice. Uh, warmest uh, regards, Conrad Sauvé, President and CEO. Uh, P.S. The Canadian Red Cross relies on your help and force of disasters. You lost me at Depends on Support. You lost me on the first line. There's more? Oh, Kevin, it never stops. Um, and then there's the, there's the message from, uh, from the Walmart folks. Gosh. Who knows how much Walmart paid for this? I don't so know. How, much, how much do I have to pay them to make this stop? I don't know if you can make I, it Is stop. that the campaign? Maybe that's what... Once you contribute, it doesn't <laughs> stop. Um, Here, take my last $100 and never send me anything else again. Catastrophe doesn't tell you when it will strike. Emergencies don't wait for you to plan. When caught in a tragic situation, okay, I'm out. I'm out. Then there's, then look. More. Look. Oh my gosh. Every gift counts. The triple, and they've got this thing that looks like a gift voucher on the bottom. And even, Kevin, even if I wanted to contribute by now, I don't know how. Stickers. Kids love stickers. <laughs> it's... Choose, choose one sticker. $35 equal, times five uh, provides five ruby bears. You can buy bears for kitties. I guess that's a nice thing to do. And I'm not dissing the concept, but I'm dissing the process. Uh, now we've got this little sticker thing in the bottom. Uh, Fifty dollars, and okay, so now we spent all this stuff to get it to us, and we got the like up Rudy the bear, and the thing, and Linda's pen, because now nobody can use it but Linda, so it's not transferable. Um, now we have postage has been paid for you. And, and not, what am I? What am I so, supposed to put in there? Whatever you can figure out here to donate. You put in here, what? and postage is paid. Like what am I? What am I putting in there? A, a check? How much does it cost to ask me to give them money? We got the postage paid. We got the gloves. We got the little bear. We got the Linda pen. We got the stickers. We got the 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 the, the, the voucher that looks like it's almost but not really a check. Uh, we got the Walmart triple. Thing. We've got the introductory letter. We've got the background thing so things don't slip around in the envelope. We've got another building strong communities thing. And of course, we have uh, the resume uh, and the CV for Rudy the Bear. Uh, and it all came in the mail for, for free. How, how many of these go out? How much does it cost to ask me for money? This is a. This is a. This is a charity, Kevin. Seems like they're doing okay. Do you get my point? <laughs> How could we not? I mean, it, it's way <laughs> over the top. It's so antiquated. So that's how that's how they're going to inspire you. Like after the, like that first page you pulled out was <sighs> less is more, people. Less is more. Hey, you gave us, you were great to, comp uh, c to contribute before. We're asking for your support in these tough times again. Please support the Red Cross. That's all you need. This is ridiculous. But I have to, I have to put a caveat on this. They are not the only charity that does this. Many cancer society, uh, the big hospitals, the big cancer hospitals in Toronto and, uh, and, and across the country, there are many, 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 many of these 
charities and charitable organizations uh, and research organizations that do this. And I'm sorry to the Red Cross because I just used you as an example, but there needs to be a better way. There needs to be a better way to not waste your resources on that kind of marketing. Because it does nothing. It does it, no good. It actually pushes me further away. It makes me not want us. to contribute. It, it did my wife and I too. Because uh, we, you're so you're so disconnected from my life. Well, we used to we. How much of our donation goes into putting together next year's marketing package? And of course, well, this, I don't like the idea of that. Well, then if, the, the if, salary of the person that makes that decision. If I throw a couple of hundred bucks at a marketing plan for that and donate to that charity, how much of that couple of hundred dollars is being used to put together those packages? Because that's not what I'm donating for. I'm donating to try to give the gift of life, as they say, which is blood. As they say, you have it in you to give. Well, yeah, but how much is it costing you to ask me to give it? I, I just had to, when that arrived yesterday, I knew, Kevin, that I had to bring that into the program. That's way over the top. Just crazy. I got apprehensive. Like, I, And I'm telling that, you. That I don't, don't want to read. I don't me, have to read I'll all right this back. stuff. I'll be right back. All of that, all of that stuff, all of that stuff was in there. It raises my anxiety, Lee. When I see that sheet of paper, I'm like, oh, God, i got to read all this and then turn it over and there's more? You can't read it all. And the postman delivered this. This is why we have door-to-door -door delivery, Kevin. <laughs> and it's just... Yep. It's ridiculous. Here, Lee, um, just to transition you out of here, uh, I tried to get again our uh, our man Rick that's in Qatar. Not happening. Uh, to no avail, and that's, uh, you know, that is what it is. But uh, here, let's take a look. Here's, um, here's a soccer group that I'm part of, and here are Canadians. Oh. Here are Canadians on their way to the match. So All when right. Rick said that so he was underground, he might have been here. Might have been here. So we are viewing uh, Qatar right now. Yes, that's Qatar. Canadian soccer uh, team takes on Belgium. Um, kickoff, I guess, if that's what they call it in soccer. Do they call it kickoff? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, is uh, 2 p.m. Come on down to Fiddler's Poor House. We've got all the screens all set up for you. It has some great food, camaraderie. Have a pop or two. And, uh, and enjoy the uh, first Canada Cup game in 36 years from Qatar playing Belgium. That's pretty amazing. Pretty doggone amazing. Yeah, pretty jack for that. 2 p.m. like yeah. you mentioned. Come down here and, uh, and watch it. So, Kevin, you go to Walmart and you see the Walmart greeter there at the, at the front. Welcome, uh, welcome, Mr. Jack. Uh, glad to have you here. And uh, sh enjoy your uh, time at Walmart. Make sure you let us know if you can't find everything you need. And you say thank you very much. And you go on your way. And uh, that could be a manager. It could, but chances are not. It's a, it's a volunteer or a lower paid uh, senior citizen that is a Walmart uh, greeter. And you're walking around. And everybody's uh, happy. And uh, the, 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 the Walmarters are are doing their thing and the employees are doing their thing and the next shift is getting ready to come out they're sitting in the break room which most of us would call like a lunch room it's a place where employees gather and uh, they're gathered getting ready for their shift uh, their manager walks in and opens fire bang 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 he opens fire with a pistol not one of these AK-47 things, a pistol, uh, and he kills seven people, six people, uh, but seven because he ends up shooting himself. Welcome to work. Hope you have a, hope you have a really successful day. What? That happened in Virginia um, yesterday, and nobody really knows why, but th this was a manager of these people they're gathered in the break room 
before they go out on their shift and bangity bang bang the walmart manager walks in and mows down a bunch of people with a pistol and then shoots himself didn't say a thing just went in and opened fire hmm a kind of uh, a kind of what you don't expect from your uh, from your visit to, to, to Walmart or your work day oh, for that matter. Brutal. And then there was a Colorado Springs one as well. Within 24 hours, there were a couple of mass shootings. And the reason I mentioned it, Kevin, is so that we don't become numb to it. Because we see these stories so often and it's, oh, look, six more people shot at a store in, in the United States. And then we move on and say, would you like fries with that? Well, <laughs> it's, not, it's not that trivial a deal. Six people died because they went to earn minimum wage at work on a Tuesday. And it was their own company that shot them. This is not stuff you take for granted. This is, thing, this is a thing that happens in a country that's infected with some kind of disease that we and they have no idea how to eradicate. There's the Club Q Colorado shooting. Attack was ended by a dad and a drag performer. This was, a, I guess, for the lack of a better word, you'd call it a gay club. An alternate sexual preference club, whatever you want to use as, a, an, as an appropriate term. And... Uh, Somebody starts opening fire, and it wasn't the law enforcement that did it. It was the guests, and as it says there, ended by uh, one of the dads there and a drag performer. They were able to subdue this fellow, but not before people were killed and seriously injured, and that was Colorado Springs. Um, Just, um, brutal. Wow. Brutal. I saw an interview on CNN with that with that guy there who brought down the gunman, yeah. and I believe his daughter's boyfriend was shot and killed. And he sit there. He took the guy down, grabbed his pistol, and started beating him with his own pistol. Man. But I, but the man couldn't even get through the interview because he broke down. I mean, you talk about a um, a traumatic moment. Um, was a, uh, yeah, go ahead, Kev. He just wanted to, to share. I don't know if you have any any thoughts on this. I was going to share a local story just along those lines because the um, St. Catharines Professional Fire Service and Nick at Niagara 411 yeah. put out a post yesterday about uh, the passing of, of uh, Jerry. Jerry, yeah. Um, all of our condolences to uh, Jerry's brothers and sisters at the Professional Firefighters Organization and his family as well. Um, the fire service announced the tragic death of one of their own, Jerry Saxton, in his 18th year of serving the community, passed away last evening. Our thoughts and prayers are with Jerry's family and co-workers um, here in Niagara. Yeah, it's a, never, never nice to have to acknowledge a fallen soldier in any one of our services. So, Jerry Saxton, um, you'll be missed. Thank you for your service and to his family, our sincere condolences on that as well. Kevin, there are many things that are happening that aren't positive in our community these days and they are a lot of things that are cumulative effects of perhaps the last two or three years. Um, rising prices of, uh, let's take restaurants for example. How many restaurants have we gone into? And uh, I haven't talked with, uh, maybe you did talk with, with uh, Dave McPerry in a little bit earlier, Kevin, proprietor here at uh, Fiddler's Poor House, as well as Monty's um, over on Ontario Street in St. Catharines. Uh, something as simple, or what we used to think of as simple as lettuce, has become a big deal. Almost every restaurant that you go into, there's either a notice on the door or the service will t uh, server will tell you that uh, uh, just so that you know, our supplies of lettuce are either gone or they're almost depleted or we're going to have to charge a premium if you want a salad, mainly romaine and, uh, and iceberg lettuce. Um, and um, just to let you know that just to pre-warn you that uh, we have this lettuce crisis on our 
hand. Really? Lettuce? I, I, I think I could grow that in my backyard. Well, maybe you can, and maybe you better start growing it in your backyard because uh, I think we have established that 99% of the lettuce that supplies us here comes from California. Uh, we have uh, an issue in California and all over the place and uh, with other things as well when it comes to supply chains on all levels, not just food, car parts, new cars, like shipping just about anything. And now we have learned that whatever lettuce that we're probably going to be getting here where we live in Niagara will be coming from Arizona. Now other than cactus, Kevin, I never would have thought that anything would be growing like lettuce and Arizona, but apparently that is, it's obviously an irrigated crop there. And, um, but it's, and you've experienced it too. You go to a restaurant, there's a sign on the door, we're either out of it, you're either gonna have to pay more for it, or we could run out of it at any given moment. There's sort of those, like those three options. Now, I didn't know that, um, that Canada's lettuce supply was so fragile. That yeah. a drought in California could mean no lettuce or super expensive lettuce. Yeah. It's, like, I, I didn't know that, and I, I can't believe that Canada gets its lettuce from California. Like, oh, we really, get a lot of, we get more from California than you have any idea. I know, but we got greenhouses all over Niagara. Can't somebody make some lettuce? It seems that there's money to be made in lettuce if we're shipping it all the way from California. But you would think if you were an agronomist, you would, and, and in Canada, you would think, okay, where is the best place in Canada if they can grow lettuce in Arizona? Where's the best place in Canada with a lot of land that we could maybe make a bunch of dough, kind of pardon the semi-pun, from growing lettuce? I'm thinking prairies? Maybe? Yeah. Maybe the prairies? I mean, it's not as dry as Arizona. And then you think California has a drought, you're like, you're on the ocean. You got, I mean, look to the west. Yeah, but the ocean does you, it does you no good. It does you no good because it's salt water. I know. Yeah. So, but, so they have to irrigate inland in order to do that. So these are, the, the, these are the things that keep us scratching our heads when it comes to this supply chain issue around the world. So good luck making your, your salads. I really like a nice Caesar salad, but it looks like it might be a while before I get one. Uh, we are expecting Scott Sutherland. Is he around? We are, and we do have Scott. And I'm just going to apologize for Scott for a second because just as we're, we're setting up Scott, I've got Rick Beaver trying to call us here from Qatar. Oh, geez. Um, well, just, I, 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 think, I think Scott will be uh, benevolent enough to give us a break here. I, I, I don't think he was super busy, and I, I don't want to make that assumption. But, Scott, if you can hang on, let's see if we can connect with Rick. Yeah, let's just see. I don't have video on him, but maybe, Rick, are you hearing us? Yeah, not exactly sure if we're uh, okay. if we're connecting with Rick there. That's a that's a tough one. Okay, well you guys keep trying and let's bring Scotty in here. Yeah. Okay, just a second here, right. and I will come over to Scott and uh, we'll bring. I mean, here's the story here. Two bright fireballs blazed over southern Ontario in one day. This is written by, by the way, Scott Sutherland, a meteorologist and science writer with the Weather Network. One of these meteors was caused by a small asteroid that is now only the sixth to ever be spotted before it hit. That's the introduction to the story from Scott Sutherland, who is joining us now. Scott, welcome back to the program. It's always so wonderful to see that lovely face. How you doing? Hope you're doing good too. Uh, I am. I I am uh, well. And boy, we have a lot. I could have you on here every week, and I would love to have you on here every week. But then people would probably get sick of me, uh, or sick of you, or both. Uh, and then I don't know how anybody could get sick of you. But um, <laughs> oh, trust me, they can. <laughs> but this one, I just had to reach out. Three twenty-six. Yeah. Three twenty-six a.m. Saturday. Uh, an mm -hmm. event, a very rare event, took yeah. place. Tell us what happened. So uh, the story starts, well, probably the story starts about four billion years ago when this space rock formed. Do we have time but, to talk about the last um, four billion years or no? No, we don't. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, so a few hours, like about just after midnight on Saturday, uh, astronomers 
I think they were at the Mount Lemmon Observatory down in the States, spotted a small asteroid. Probably about, it's a little less than a meter wide. Probably about 70 centimeters. Size of a beach ball, maybe? Yeah. And, uh, Kevin, Scott tracking has a little it, very hand quickly of tracking it. <laughs> very quickly tracking yeah. it, they found that it was, um, going to hit Earth. Okay. And tracing it, they found that it was actually going to hit right above us, basically. Um, it entered the atmosphere just north of um, Lake Erie, um, just south of Brantford, I believe it was, and then it tracked over Grimsby, and it ended its flight somewhere just on the southern shores of Lake Ontario. It was captured by cameras all over the place. Um, I myself posted one that the, the one of the CN Tower cameras captured. And um, yeah, it was only the sixth ever so far, um, asteroid to have been spotted prior to impact. Wow. Now, how... You might have mentioned this and I probably missed it. How big was this original asteroid? Yeah, prob well, they said it was about, um, about 70 centimeters wide. 70? So, a little over, a little over two feet. Um... Size of size of a beach ball, perhaps. Okay, so how do we differentiate when we say the word asteroid? We think right. of something relatively sizable. I yeah, mean, that's what yeah. that's what clicks into our mind. Right. Something the size of a beach ball, we would those of us laymen would probably think either meteor or meteorite. What qualifies it as an asteroid as opposed to a meteor? The, the the technical differentiation is it's really really um, like it's nitpicking basically um, anything anything any space rock floating out in space is technically called a meteoroid meteoroid and meteoroid okay and then so this would have been a meteoroid but the the more common term is an asteroid uh, I think astronomers usually reserve that for anything bigger than bigger than a meter. Or bigger than ten meters, or something like that. It's something that's so, much more, much okay. more mass to it, much so, uh, much more sizable. But, is it? Yeah. So this was a meteoroid. When it entered the atmosphere, it produced a meteor, which is the glow, which is that bright flash that it produced, that the rock produces. And then when it hits the ground, it's a meteorite. Because by then it's smaller. Well, just that a meteorite is uh, any any rock found on Earth that came from space. Oh, okay. So it's it's so, it's that it's that clear a definition. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, it start, if it, nothing it's, survives, then it wouldn't produce meteorites. Okay, but so if it start, something survives it start, on the ground. It starts out as technically an asteroid, but is really a meteoroid. Then, because of its activity, the fireball, etc., that's a meteor. Right. Right. And then by the time it lands, it's a meteorite. Yeah, when it hits the ground, that's when they call it a meteorite. But it's still the same thing are... all the way through its yeah. all the way through its transitions. It's still the same hunk of rock. Yep, exactly. So now do we this one even had a name. Hey, they called uh, this one even had a name to it. They actually named it before because it was a, they discovered it. They were yeah. they named it. It has a. It has a preliminary name that's still technical, but it's uh, right now it's twenty it's twenty twenty two WJ one, which okay. just designates like when it was discovered. Right. So, second and half of November in twenty twenty two. Yeah. So did we see this coming? Yeah, we had three hours. We knew notice. it was coming. Yeah. Why didn't you tell us? And they were that's that's where they were able to track it so so closely and actually uh, meteor scientists were alerted to it beforehand and were actually able to knew to where to look some went out and looked for it like um, okay. some meteor experts so, from Western University actually traveled to Grimsby because they knew that that was where it was going to travel over so were you guys keeping this a secret no no they only knew about it three hours ahead of time oh three hours yeah three oh, hours just here, three hours here I'm thinking they were tracking it for like weeks oh no no there, there right. are ones that we th that they know far ahead of time that they may hit us. Like there's a one in, 
couple of thousand chance of it hitting us. But okay. these are those are tens, hundreds of years of the future. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. These we've ones we're cl- these Sorry. ones we're seeing now are very small, and so they detect them. Yeah, maybe when they're like a few tens of thousands of kilometers out. All right. So, yeah. um, we have talked numerous times about the fact that the doomsday asteroid is something of sci-fi, right? Yeah. Um, there, 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 there's no doomsday asteroid out there. Uh, but w- w- let's say that this rock um, would have qualified by being maybe a thousand times bigger right. than, it, than it was. Mm-hmm. Would this have been one of those things that could qualify as one of those doomsday asteroids? Well, uh, something maybe, something maybe ten meters twenty or ten meters would be like uh, that Chelyabinsk back in twenty thirteen. Okay. The one that was over Russia, that one that exploded, it, it broke a lot of windows, it injured some people. Yeah. If you go up to like. A hundred meters, you get to start. Like that's a city killer. That's if, it, if that exploded over Toronto, it would level to most of Toronto. It would be like a nuclear blast going off. But anything get, of so so. Let me continue here along my yeah. train. Um, anything that would be of that magnitude, mm-hmm. sci- scientists and astronomers are already aware of. Correct? Yeah. These things have yeah. already been identified. It's not like they, you're gonna, so. So even this little thing, even this little beach ball thing, didn't really take us by surprise. No. Some do, um, but yeah, we're getting. They're getting much better at detecting these things beforehand. They have uh, surveys going on every night, telescopes around the world watching for these objects. Okay. And they're detecting more all the time. They detect hundreds of new yeah. asteroids. Not. They're not new. They're just new to us uh, um, every year, right? Um, but they, but it's just we've had four and a half billion years of time flying around the sun that Earth has swept up most, if not all, of the big threats so far. So, all the big asteroids that we know about, they've already settled into an orbit that they're never going to hit us. And there are occasional ones that that they're they're concerning. It's like it comes a little bit too close, maybe a hundred <laughs> years from now. Okay, but we don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Okay. What about but, what? Okay. So, before I ask that question, I'm going to back up and talk about sure. this event. Right. I know that there are agencies, uh, government agencies, etc., perhaps even you and and your network, etc., that are trying to find where this uh, now would be classified as a meteorite uh, right. landed. Right. Uh, has there been any further information in your circle as to where this thing hit? The location, yeah. Um, they actually think that there are fragments of this of this uh, meteoroid up, scattered around uh, Grimsby and McNabb area. Okay. Because it flew right over them, and it was fra- it was fragmenting at that point. So there were all these. There's probably all these little fragments. Maybe all right, so a is, grand... is, it, is, is it fragmenting because it's coming through the atmosphere and heating yeah. up and breaking up? Yeah, the pr- the air pressure is is basically crushing it as it's flying through the air. Okay. And it's breaking pieces off and and scattering them. So they figure that there are small pieces, like starting maybe just to the west of Grimsby. And then they they probably scatters throughout Grimsby and then across that little bit of the lake shore towards the little peninsula on McNabb. There might be slightly larger pieces there, but the major mass, like maybe 10 yeah. kilometers or 10 kilometers, 10, 10 kilograms in right. size or so, would be in Lake Ontario because of the track. Oh, of it. probably so they in the lake. Probably itself. won't. Yeah, they probably won't recover anything that fell in the lake. Right. But who knows? But there, there may be fragments scattered along that section of the Ontario Lakeshore where people can just, uh, they might be in their backyard. They might be on their roofs or in their gutters <laughs> or found on the side of the road. And I mean, what would, what, would be, possible. what would be the smallest and then the biggest fragment that we might find? Would it go like from pebble to rock or like yeah. what sort of size yeah. thing could we be looking for? 
this um, you're probably never going to find anything that's like a grain of sand or that sort of thing. That's just too small. But yeah, you could find ones that are pebble sized, ones that are slightly larger, maybe uh, towards McNabb, maybe something along the signs of a of a of a um, a baseball size yeah. or something like that, maybe. And then to go to um, what Kevin is showing on the screen that you can't see, right after that, we had a bunch of snow. So, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so, chances are if there's anything there, we might have shoveled it away. It's possible, yeah. I mean, if you've, if, if, in, if anybody in Grimsby or McNabb or in that, anywhere in between has shoveled their driveway, maybe take a, take a strong magnet and run it through that snow pile. Yeah. Because you might find something. Because and these so, these meteorites are, ma- are they respond to magnets. I was just going to say. So, so this is a magnetic uh, substance. Yeah, uh, they have, usually have a high iron content. So that even if they they feel like a rock, they may still st- they'll, they'll still stick to a magnet. They don't have cool. to be uh, an iron meteorite for that. All right. Uh, so they'll probably have a black coating on at least one side. That's the fusion crust it develops as it punches through the air. And um, rent one of those metal detector things. Yeah. If you have a metal detector, um, if you have one of those little neodymium magnets, the really, really strong ones, but they'll they'll respond. Like if you find a rock in your backyard that wasn't there before the weekend and it looks yeah. a little weird, cool. grab a fridge magnet. Grab a fridge a magnet off your fridge and see if it'll stick. Because you might have a meteor. <laughs> and if you That's do, cool. And if you do, there's there's uh, scientists at Western University that would certainly like to get a, get a look at them. And the Royal Ontario Museum has a great meteorite collection and great meteorite scientists that would want to see these as well that's very that's very cool now um i mean when i whenever i see something like this i know that those of us novices or uh, whatever that we think this is a big deal and very exciting um but th- this time it seems like you folks in the scientific community have also found this pretty interesting oh yeah this, this is always a fascinating thing that when this happens i mean the unexpected ones are pretty amazing even Saturday night, there was a, a second fireball that went off north uh, east of Toronto, and what and that was that? That was pretty spectacular to see too. That just a, a random. That was probably more something more along the lines of a, like a pebble or, or a small rock. It wasn't something the size of that, the one on Saturday morning. But something that but, just just flares up in the atmosphere. Yeah, it just it just hit, flared up, created a nice green glow, wowed a bunch of people. Wow. Um, but but. Who knows if that would produce meteorites? I think it was too fast. But this one was, you know, they, they knew about it beforehand. It hit exactly where they said it would. It tracked through a long way. It was caught on multiple cameras. Uh, and it may have dropped meteorites. And it's just, that's, that that talks to us. We really yeah. love to see that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty neat. Now, whenever we have a chance to talk, and this has always been the case going back years, um, right. I always ask you, Bef- while I have you, to let us know if what is on your radar screen, because we always hear about things sort of after the fact, uh, et cetera. Right. But right. Uh, what's what's happening out there in our uh, outside our world right now that's really getting your attention? Is it the new telescope? Is it uh, is it something else? What's what's like right on what what's on your screen right now? Well, what's on the tip of my brain at the moment is uh, the, the James Webb Space Telescope just reported in, like it has, a, a, there's an automated bot on Twitter that tells what it's looking at right. at any time. And the, one of the latest targets was the TRAPPIST-1 solar system. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a star, TRAPPIST-1 is a star several light years away from us that has seven planets orbiting around it in a tight, tight orbits. It's okay. a really small. It's a really small star system. Okay. But three of these planets, at least, are possibly in that star's habitable zone. And if that star is a nice, quiet one that doesn't, you know, blast its planets with solar flares all the time, yeah, there might be life there. And the James Webb Space Telescope is equipped with uh, sensors and and instruments that could provide us with not proof that there's life, but at least signs in the atmosphere or, or whatever of these planets that's, that there's a possibility. Yeah. Uh, now, there's an equal chance that these planets, if this star has been really active, it may have just blasted them all clean and 
because they're so close in. But I'm really excited about that. I mean, that's that's what I've been waiting for. That and how how far? I, I know we can have a very difficult time wrapping our head around distances, but how far away is this? Trappist one is uh, it's forty light years away. Well, that's not that's so, not as far as I thought you too, were going to say. No, that that's almost right in our galactic backyard. It's right in our backyard. So, yeah, and and the the the, the planetary system itself has been famous already just because yeah. of wow. us detecting so many of these rocky planets, and they're all roughly Earth size. So. Um, it, it's really exciting. There could be somebody to, that, that in what are they call? There. there could be something in what do they call the Goldilocks zone? The Goldilocks zone, exactly. Yep. So See, I'm really I, looking I, forward. I, to I this. pay attention when I listen to you. You do. You do always. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Wow, that's uh, that's yeah. amazing, uh, Scott. It's always a pleasure. And uh, same here. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you an assignment. Uh, it's a pretty easy one. The, sure. assign, the assignment is, if you yeah. wake up one morning or you go to, in, uh, go to work one morning or wake up in the middle of the night and say, wow, I'm absolutely uh, about this, contact me and say, I want to come on the show, all right? Or just okay. call us or, or, or whatever. Uh, then I don't have to chase you all over the planet. You can, you can sort of volunteer. Yeah, okay, I will do that, definitely. All right. Okay. Yep. Oh, the Lego. Oh, before you go. Yeah, yeah. We got to talk Lego. Okay. Yeah. Um, um did you did me. you see when we had Brick and Nick on? No. I didn't. Oh. But he's a friend of mine. We know each other. Yeah. Well, that's what that's what that's he's a what great he, guy. That's what he told us. Was this what Kevin 2 weeks ago? Yeah, 2 or 3 weeks ago. And so, I haven't watched this week's episode yet, Scott, so don't uh, don't yeah. spill the beans. No, no, no. I won't. Uh, me and my family are absolutely hooked on Lego Masters. We love it, and there's such a strong Canadian contingent this year that it makes yeah. it seem a little closer to home. And, uh, yeah. and Brick and Nick's contributions and what these guys do, and I know you're a bit of a Lego geek yourself, and Brick and Nick was giving shout out to you, saying, yeah, I know oh, yeah. I know Scott as well. So um, so yep. really cool. You ever attempted anything like, like they do on the show? No, I mean, Nick and Stacey are doing amazing builds on that show. I mean, I, I, I couldn't go on there. I, I built interesting things, like I, I like building the space Lego and stuff, uh, NASA models and such. But um, I couldn't handle the pressure, I don't think. Like, I need time to sit down and work these things out. But the, the stuff that they create is just amazing. I love it. Well, if you go if you go onto YouTube because all of our uh, or the WeStream site, but go to YouTube, do WeStream, and all of our shows that we've done here in Niagara Four One One Live with Lee Steri are all archived there. So if you go back a couple of weeks, oh, perfect. Um, you can see the interview that we do with Brick and Nick, and uh, you get an honorable mention. You have a cameo appearance awesome. on that on that show. Excellent. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks, man. That's Good awesome. luck. Uh, it's always a yeah. pleasure, uh, even though we don't talk uh, often here. often enough. Uh, we love you and uh, keep on uh, keep on trucking, as they say. Okay. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, man. Talk bye. To you soon. Yeah. Bye. Yep. Bye, bye. <sighs> interesting. Interesting. Talented. The uh, people. These nerds that we uh, run across. <laughs> and oh, and, and I, I use that to, I use that term. Uh, with all with all affection because they know they're nerds and they love being nerds. I just don't happen to be one of them. I just know a bunch of them. <laughs> um, so Lee, I'm just going to yeah. try and reach out again to uh, to our man in Qatar. Yeah. This will be my final yeah. effort to okay. see if we can connect with him. I yeah. mean, it's Qatar, and there's also you know seventy or eighty thousand people jammed into a pretty small space. So and who knows what what their what their internet accessibilities are in that country let alone Wi-Fi and all that stuff. So yeah, exactly. while you're doing that, I just want to uh, acknowledge once again our sponsors that uh, enable us to bring you really cool stuff like we've been able to bring you today. Gail's Gas Bars, thank you for fueling this program for as long as you have done. A living wage employer here in Niagara as well as a rainbow registered company. 
And uh, in these uh, harrowing times of supply issues and uh, oil prices jumping up and down, et cetera, Gales gas bars have always been a constant here in Niagara, helping us uh, do what we do every day. So we thank them for that and to Verge Insurance Group. Uh, also, thank you so much for being a part of this show. We do have uh, uh, sponsorship or two available. They are very affordable. They are very effective. We've already reached more than 2.4 million people on this program this year. And uh, if you think that uh, showing off your product or your business to 2.4 million people uh, plus every year is a good deal, um, we'll prove it to you. <laughs> so get in touch with us. And if you want to participate in the show, think of it as a talk show. If you've heard anything that you want to rebut or add to or bring up as something brand new, all you have to do is do this, uh, this, uh, this uh, thing right here. Right here. Right. Clean. Ching, 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 ching. All right. Now yeah, we'll hook you up. Leap. Uh, we got Lucas Body, the boxer, professional boxer. Last week we talked to uh, Dennis Steingart, who just won the gold in the Ontario the amateur. Amateurs. Yeah. Uh, Lucas Body is undefeated as a professional, 12 and 0, 11 knockouts, and he steps back in the ring again this weekend. So he's going to be joining us in a few minutes. Okay. Um, Want to share with you this video that I caught online on Facebook this week? It's actually a TikTok video, but you know TikTokers share their videos across many social platforms. Um, and it was all the snow, and you know, hey, empty parking lot. Lots of snow, yeah. and I got a big truck. <laughs> and uh, and here's what the guys at uh, Two Men in a Truck decided to do. This looks like it's uh, the Canadian Tire on uh, on Welland Ave in St. Catharines. Okay. So two guys in a truck, and we're driving. Yeah, there's it's a Canadian Tire, and they're doing some <laughs> doing doing some figure eights. I mean, we all did this growing up, right? Of course, we did. And then all of a sudden they made front wheel drives, so you had to do it in reverse. Oh, I know that. Or pull the handbrake. That ruined the whole thing. But look Trust at these it guys. for your moving needs. If these guys can drive like that, your belongings are safe. <laughs> Wee! And you know what? To me, this is actually a credit to the guys. Shows that they're human and they're having fun. That's like, actually, I don't look at this and go, well, I'm never trusting them. You're like, no, absolutely. Of course These you're going to trust awesome. them. They're not going to do it with your furniture on there. <laughs> and, and, and you can bet they own the truck, too. So, so they're not doing it with somebody else's truck. <laughs> I mean, that is, that's the Welland Ave Canadian Tire, the Walmart, the oh, no yeah. frills in the background. That's, that's definitely that parking lot. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> a couple of other local things, Kevin, that happened over the uh, over the last little while that I just took note of. Remember all of the the harangue and the the conversation and the the what am I trying to look at? The there's a word I'm searching for and it won't come to me. Anyway, the dissension that took place over Jeff Dunham coming to perform at the uh, Meridian Center here yeah, in St. Catharines. Well, he did perform over this past weekend, and there was not, I never saw one derogatory comment. He apparently put on a spectacular show. People loved it, had a fabulous time, and said, uh, come back again. And uh, he was funnier than ever with new material, et cetera, et cetera. So there was all this controversy. That's the word I was looking for. It was all this controversy about, are we going to let someone with this kind of racist and, uh, um, and negative persona do his act here in St. Catharines? He's a flippin' comedian that talks with dummies. Hello? What is your problem with this here? What is your problem with this here? Obviously, there was no problem because Jeff Dunham came to town, put on a great show. Everybody loved it. So everybody else go pound salt. All right. I, I was talking with somebody yesterday that was Sheesh. at the show, and they said that he addressed it right off the top. Oh, did he? Yeah, and he said, you know what? And not necessarily St. Catherine specific, but kind of saying generically that I do get a lot of pushback from people. And he said, if you put 100 people in the room, two people would be offended, and I don't care. Yeah. But... At the same time, you're preaching to the converted, right? I mean, Kevin, I, ha I, I probably offended a thousand people today. I don't know. 
<laughs> but it's a show we do. We I don't know. I, I get where they're coming from because without knowing all of the characters, some of the dummies and the puppets do portray negative racial stereotypes. Yes. And I did morning shows for 17 years on morning radio across Canada that I probably couldn't do today because I had characters that would show up on my show that I wrote, that I voiced. They were my characters. They were my people. I had this troop of people that would go through the studio on any given day, and I'm not the only one from that era that did that kind of morning show radio. And you know what? I pissed a lot of people off. But you know what also? I made a lot of people laugh. There's a great story about this. I'll try, I'll try to tell it really short. So, way back in the 80s, I had a character uh, that, uh, that talked with a, uh, let's shall we say, um, Middle Eastern accent. All right? So, and, and he was a lot of fun. He was a smart guy, he wasn't stupid or whatever. So anyway, um, I was out at a golf course playing with my buddy, and uh, we finished the day. He'd locked his keys in his car. We had no way home. There were only two other guys on the golf course. They were both pharmacists, and they were both of, uh, of, of Eastern European um, uh, lineage. So, uh, and they were pharmacists, accomplished guys. So, we're sitting in the back seat. They're giving us a ride back home. And my, my friend outs me. He tells them who I am. And they say, he does, do you do that character, uh, whatever? Um, and I, I, I was just going to smack my friend. I was like, why do you do this to me? And so I said, yes, I do that character. And he turned around in his seat, and I thought he was going to hit me. And he said, I love that guy. And everybody laughed. So you know what? Sometimes we're a little bit too sensitive. Uh, but that was a long time ago. Uh, and um, you're always going to offend somebody. If you don't offend somebody, you're not doing, some, you're not doing anything. I had a guy tell me that one time. He was a boss of mine. He was a program director at a radio station. He was an entertainment coach. And he said, you know what? Um, you could be like this guy over here, but he doesn't do anything. And if you don't do anything, you're not doing anything. Hey, Lee, I'm just going to hop in here. It looks like uh, we just got a call here from Rick Beaver from Qatar. Are we going to try again? We have a connection. All right, Rick, awesome. Can, Rick, can you hear us? Oh, man. Rick, hello? Yeah, that's tough. It's Qatar. There's thousands uh, of people I feel so. I feel so sorry for him because he's probably trying so hard. Yeah, he is trying to accommodate us. And it looks like we just had Lucas on... Um, yeah, there he is. Okay. So uh, so let's go over to here because, uh, I mean, this guy's... He's, he's the prince, man. I'll, uh, I'll bring on Lucas Body. Lucas Body is in, Ni from, uh, in Niagara Falls. Uh, down is the prince. Lucas, how the hell are you? Good to see you. Doing great. Good. Doing great. Uh, 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 ready for, uh, sorry, if you can, uh, you're driving right now, right? Yeah, I'm being. I'm actually uh, I'm being chauffeured. <laughs> you're what? He's being chauffeured as opposed to actually. Oh, you're being the chauffeured. Wheel. Okay. Uh, if you if you can bring yourself a little closer to the microphone, that would be cool. We could hear you a little bit better. Oh, we can almost scratch your beard, Lucas. Yeah, I know. Okay. Hey, let me ask you something. Uh, beards, is that a competitive advantage in boxing? Does it does it cushion a blow? Uh, I don't know. It's my first time playing with a beard like this, so we'll find out. So um, you are you, you've got a fight coming up. You are um, what? What is your level right now? What uh, what weight class do you fight in? I fight at the lightweight division at 135 pounds. Okay. Um, and tell us a little bit about your background. Where uh, where are you on the pecking order uh, at, at the moment in your sport? Where where am I? Well, I'm, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm number one in the world. You are number one in the world in your in, in your sport. In in what? Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to. At what platform? Like what? Uh, w W whatever. Well, I just haven't proven it yet. <laughs> I love that but, attitude. Uh, okay. All right. No, I, I mean, hey, come on, Lee. The guy's 12-0, and 0, 
11 knockouts. This well, this is where I was going. This is what this is what I was looking so, for. So I mean, if he's not number one now, he's charting on, in the right direction, right? Okay. So I get, what what uh, what organization do you fight under? What umbrella do you fight under? Well, there's there's uh, what four major organizations in boxing. Um, but you fight under all of them, right? It's not like it's oh, okay. not like you get pick one. I mean, you get you get you could try getting ranked in one by fighting for titles in that organization, right? Uh, my last fight there, I fought for the WBA NABA gold title, which is the WBA organization. Um, so there, there's different routes that you can go depending on which titles you're gonna. Uh, challenge for right but uh there's it's not like you just fight for one um, un, under one umbrella you fight under uh, all of them it's it's uh it's it's not like the ufc where they have their own organization right box has understood it's open it's so it must open. be it must be a little bit yeah. difficult to sort of uh um uh, sort of mas- massage your way through there you've got to have a pretty good management team to help guide you through this right absolutely uh, every fight has to be everything has to be done properly where you're fighting the right guys at the right time to get the right rankings going in the right direction right so it's it's uh, everything's about timing and uh, you want to make sure you're fighting the right guys at the right time. That's all. So tell us about the next fight. My my next fight Saturday, um, and I'm fighting very very durable guy. Um, all his losses come from undefeated prospects. Um, he's very very tough, and he's a guy that's going to take me some rounds to figure out. Okay. And, uh, bring me the next the next level right every fight you want to fight a guy that's a little bit better a little bit better a little bit better until you make it to the top isn't that that's, that sounds like the best way to do it though i mean you, you learn from fighting people that are uh at least at your level and maybe just a little bit above so that it helps you rise to that level right exactly exactly some guys you know they they jump in too quick and then it's a big competition shock, right? Um, I mean, I fight the best as an amateur, but the pro game is a different, a different sport. Right. So I'm still building my way up as a professional. Now, so you're you're fighting a guy by the name of Diego Chavez, and uh, you say he's sort of a tough competitor. Where do you where do you guys meet in the ring? Where's the fight happening? Well, he's a guy that comes forward and uh, brings brings the action. So I want to put him out of his comfort zone. So I, I plan on putting some heat on him right from the beginning. I want to set the tone right away. So I'm going to be pressing him as soon as the bell rings in the first round. Where did the, where did the name The Prince come from? Came from probably my seventh or eighth fight as an amateur. Uh, um, a coach from Orangeville named Brian Mackey, a good friend of mine. He actually gave me the Prince. He, uh, the Nick Prince. He he uh, announced me as the Prince um, back in like 2013, and ever ever since then it's stuck. So, how would you describe your uh, how would you describe your style? Are you a puncher? Are you a dancer? Are you a prancer? Um, how, how do you how do you approach this uh, sweet science as they've called it for years? I would I would say a boxer puncher. Um, I'm not a guy that moves around too much and just you know looks for points. I'm a guy that had athletic ability, but that could hit like a heavyweight. So. I, I would say a boxer puncher would best describe me. And where is the fight? When is it? I, I know you said Saturday, but where is it? It's in Brampton. It's at the Red Owl facility in Brampton. It's a really nice setup they got. Okay, and uh, and we can still we can get tickets and all 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 the rest of it to go. Now, see, he's just frozen there. Lee. Oh, we just froze. We'll come up. back. 
But yeah. um, you know what? I'll throw it up here. And you can see right there. I mean, if you just look for Lucas Oh, yeah, body, there we go. Yeah, and you can see you can also uh, buy streaming passes on DAZN. It's 7 p.m. Eastern is when the whole card gets underway. And uh, where do you fit on the card, Lucas? Are you uh, are you the main event at this point? Uh, yeah, I'm the main event at this point. Nice. Show. Awesome. Nice. Yeah. Good for you. Um, Lee, want to throw something in here um, just because I think we'd be remiss if we didn't. And, Lucas, um, I've seen a lot of outpouring of support in the last couple of days uh, for Coach Willis McManaman. Um, I know he was a Niagara Falls guy. You posted something about it. So I want to give you an opportunity um, to just talk about uh, how many people he touched and the influence he had on your career. Yes. So Willis started coaching me uh, probably in 2016, um, closer to the end of my amateur career. And uh, he he brought a whole other uh, level to my game at the end of my amateur career that that uh, really really helped me and benefited me um he was i was really close with him he was he was a good good friend of mine uh, as well as a coach and um he helped a lot of fighters and a lot of people in niagara i mean for the short amount of time that he was here since two, i think he moved here 2016 i i can't believe how many people he touched and how many people he knew and helped out um since being here and uh, unfortunately, last week he passed away, and uh, he's he's going to be missed uh, big time by not only me, but uh, uh, everyone. Fox community. Well, we're very, very, very sorry for your loss and our loss, and uh, glad that you had an opportunity to pay some tribute to your coach, um, Lucas. Uh, have yourself a, a hell of a fight on uh, Saturday night. As uh, Elton John would say, Saturday night's all right for fighting. So hopefully <laughs> it's, it's all right for you. Congratulations on your career. Now, what did Kevin say? You are 11-0 and or 12-0 and at this point? Currently 12-0 and with 11 knockouts. 12-0 and with 11 knockouts. I don't know if you know, Lee, but that's, uh, that's pretty good. I do know this, Kevin. <laughs> and I want to see you hang a 13 on, uh, on this guy Saturday night. Yeah, way to go. Uh, congratulations on a, on a stellar career. You obviously have the attitude for it. And uh, when you came in here and you told me you're number one in the world, uh, uh, you just haven't got the belt yet. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was pretty good. Uh, Lucas, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for taking time out of your day because I know uh, you got a lot going on here between now and Saturday. So um, um, Godspeed, man. Good luck. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you guys. You are welcome. And uh, come back and talk to us, all right? Absolutely. Anytime. Thank you. All right. Salute. Bye-bye. Pretty awesome, eh? 12 and 0, 11 knockouts. Holy crap. He's a thumper. Holy crap. And these are the type of uh, of lighter division bouts that I want to watch. Right? I mean, think oh, of I love it. the lightweights. I love them. I know, but so often they're missing the knockout punch, right? You see guys yeah. that are 22 and whatever, and they got three knockouts. Not Lucas. I used He's to punch it back in the back in the day before uh, all this uh, um, mixed martial arts and UFC stuff started and everything. I, I used to follow boxing uh, a lot, and the heavyweights are just fun to watch because they're sluggers. But but there isn't a lot of activity going on a lot of the time. You watch some of these welterweights and lightweights. And uh, like the Sugar Ray Leonard's of the world, and the Roberto Durant's, and uh, and and these boxers of the of, of the past, man, they're they're like lightning, uh, and uh, just just fascinating, absolutely fascinating to watch. Now, Lee, we're about to wrap up the show. I got to go put the outdoor camera on. An update: last I checked, it was seven nothing, Spain over Costa Rica. So that's oh, a blowout. But I mean, that's an that's an embarrassing loss. Get your butts down here to Fiddlers. 2 p.m. kickoff, yeah. Canada v. Belgium, first time in 36 years that they're in the big dance. That That's an embarrassing uh, loss. Uh, happy for Spain fans, but not so, not so feeling good for the Costa Rica fans. You want to at least be able to hold your head up at the end of the game, but it looks like they might not be able to do that. This has been a really great show for us uh, happening on this day. 
of course, the first day in 36 years that Canada has had a team to participate and playing in, uh, in the FIFA World Cup competitions. And of course, those competitions are coming from Qatar. Uh, we've been pronouncing that country for the last two or three years, uh, Qatar or Qatar or whatever. Um, and now all of a sudden it's back to Qatar, which I prefer because in our simple world, that's how it's spelled, uh, Q-A-T-A-R, Qatar. Uh, it makes, uh, makes perfect sense to me. Again, I uh, want to thank Gales Gaspars Limited for fueling this program, as well as Verge Insurance Group, the, uh, the Verge Group for, uh, for supporting us. Kevin Jack and, uh, and Brandon Scram, the co-founders of uh, WeStream that made this whole streaming technology possible. And it is the premier streaming company in Canada. If you've been watching any of your council uh, members be re-indoctrinated or sworn in over the last week or so, and you've been watching it streamed over their Facebook pages or their websites, it has been WeStream that's been doing it. And uh, Kevin, I guess it's been an interesting week for you uh, from that perspective. Yeah, we have been uh, very busy myself, and I'll just, you know, I'll share some video here. Uh, WeStream was doing three inaugural council meetings on Monday night and another three last night, and then concurrently streaming the council meeting, regular council meeting for the city of Niagara Falls. Right. And I mean, here, uh, here's a shot of us out at Vienne Vineyards, which is beautiful. Niagara is so awesome. I'd never been to Vienne. I would encourage anybody. I mean, that look at that really room. That is a really cool place. It really it is. It is gorgeous. And it's just, you know, another winery in Niagara. We have so many beautiful destinations. This is on Fly Road, mm -hmm. which about maybe five minutes out from Balls Falls. You, you get through Camden, and then you're there. The gentleman Vienne. that owns that is one of the oldest vintners, uh, lo longest standing vintners, uh, I should say. In, uh, in Niagara. It's not a huge, huge property, but well, well thought of in, uh, in the wine industry here in Niagara and a beautiful place. Yeah, and, then, uh, and then last night, I'll just share here, I was out at uh, John Michael's Banquet Center, and that was for the, uh, the inaugural meeting for the city of Thoreau. And there you see former Mayor Henry D'Angela mm -hmm. uh, signing his oath into office. And, uh, you know, that was a beautiful venue and, and well attended. And there's a new councillor, Mike DeVitas, being sworn into. A, so, yeah, we've been, we've been very busy Monday, Tuesday, and tonight. Uh, we stream will be in City Council St. Catharines for a budget committee chaired by new mayor, Matt Sisko. All right. Now, um, all, of these, all of these things that you, all these streaming um, events that you do are available for people to go back and have a look at through YouTube, through your site, correct? Uh, most often, we're streaming on other people's sites. So, it could, but it's always available on their sites. Exactly. So you would go to YouTube and look for City of Thorold. Look for City of Port Colborne. We did sure. Port Colborne. We did Wayne Fleet. We did Thorold. We did West Lincoln. Lincoln. Gosh, and all points in between. Who do we have playing us off the stage today, KJ? Uh, musically, we're going to hear from Sleepy Jean. Sleepy Jean. We, they have been on the program before. Yeah, Sleepy Jean's been on. And let's see, what are we going to play today? What are we going to play today? Um... Saw one there, and sorry for me humming and hawing and being non-committal. Well, that's uh, right. Smaller, her official music video for her song "Smaller." Uh, and okay, uh, and before we do that, I do want to thank, even though we were not able to connect, uh, Rick Beaver for trying. I mean, he's in a really, really exciting place right now in Qatar, uh, in the in the stadium where they're going to be playing, uh, where Canada's going to be playing Belgium in about a half an hour. And he's been trying to get in touch with us and we've been trying to get in touch with him because we wanted to at least maybe have a, a conversation, if not a visual conversation with him. And uh, it's probably been stressful for him. So if he ever gets a chance to watch this program, Rick, thank you very much for trying. Uh, we knew it was a long shot that we would actually be able to get you on the program, but thanks for trying, enjoy the game. I know we're there in spirit with you in uh, Qatar, and uh, thanks so much for trying. Scott Sutherland, science writer and meteorologist with the Weather Network. Always a plethora of information coming from him about those, uh, the, the asteroid, meteoroid, meteor, meteorites, and fireballs 
that happened over the weekend here in Niagara. If you want to check him out, all you have to do is go to the site of uh, the Weather Network and you can find all of his articles under uh, just Scott Sutherland and he's, uh, he's one of the premier science writers uh, in the country. So you can uh, find out more detail and watch his videos and things like that that he's done. Uh, and he'll go into a little bit more detail than he had a chance to do today. Kevin, always a pleasure working with you, my you friend. You as well. And uh, enjoy, uh, enjoy being played off the stage and enjoy the game today. Go Canada. I still think uh, people are underrating you. I think we got a chance. So go Canada. Hear the whippoorwill call I trips down the wall I've stuttered, I've stalled The time There's this fine line It's deficient Oh.